All right. Cheers, mate. We're live. Sorry. Good morning, Brett. My fault today. I struggled to uh, turn the computer on and get it restarted and all that sort of stuff. So a little bit late, but uh, we're here. Here we are. Good morning to uh, good morning to the folk over in India, waiting waiting for the show. Yeah, six over there, six waiting and loving it. There it is. <laughs> All right, Brett. we're good. How was mate. your we're weekend, in. Brett? How was your weekend? What went up? What went out? What went down? What did go down this weekend, mate? Uh, not a lot. Not a lot. There's this. There's this huge murder trial going on in the states right now. I don't know if you've seen it, but oh. um, <laughs> it's. This guy's last name is Murder, uh, but it's spelled like M-U-R-D-A-U-G-H. Okay. That's how he's, his name is spelled like that, Murder. But they co- they pronounce it Murdoch. But I guess Netflix just came out with a series this weekend while the trial is going on. So it's just, it's fascinating. Like I was watching, I turned my TV on the other day and this trial was on live. You know how they do that in America where they have these live trials and this guy's this guy's talking about defending himself about how he didn't kill his wife and daughter. And I was like, this is crazy. Uh, wife and son, actually. Um, and I'm like, this is crazy. And then all of a sudden, Netflix released this thing over the weekend where like six people have died in the last like three years, either by him or his sons, or it was just like this whole conspiracy of all these people that have died. And so I'm watching it live. Netflix puts this thing on, so I've just I've just been fascinated by this whole. Sure. Uh, yeah. So America, mate, you know they trap you in these things. Yeah. So. Oh. So I've well, been watching that all weekend. Good stuff. I might have to check it out on Netflix later. We got we got we got more people from India in the comments. India is apparently our demographic today. Hello to everyone in India. Where where are you in India? Uh, APS swim. Yeah, uh, yeah. India's a big place. Whereabouts in India? God, what a stupid question. Who would win 100 IM, Dressel or Andrew? I mean, are they, are they aware this race has happened a million times over at ISL and Dressel is, like, really quite good? Mm. Mm. But also not swimming, which we didn't talk about last week. But where is where is Caleb Dressel, Brett? I don't know. Is Caleb coming back? That's the question we're going to ask every week. Is Caleb coming back? Caleb Dressel. We all miss him. We all love him. He's out there in the wilderness somewhere. Every now and then he'll post something about a sponsor. Um, so we know he's alive and well. But he's not racing, and I don't know if he's training with anybody. Uh, so that will be the ongoing question this year. Where is Caleb Dressel? Hopefully this uh, this little question we ask every week will get answered real quick, and he will come back because he's great for the sport. But uh you know his his mental well being is the priority here, and hopefully he's happy with what's going on, regardless of where or not he's swimming. Oh yeah, he's happy. He's out there. He's alive. We know that. He's married. He's got uh, he's got animals. He's on a farm. You know that he's tending to. So look, I think I think for all accounts he's happy. But we're not talking about Caleb Dressel, the man outside of swimming. We're talking about Caleb Dressel, the man inside of swimming, who's the Olympic champ, who's the world champ, who's the world record holder. And we all miss him. And we just want to know if he's going to swim this year. That's it. It's not, uh, we're not, I'm not asking for his uh, life update, you know? It's just, uh, <laughs> hey, we're going to see you in swimming again. That's it. Simple. I mean, I'd love to see him swim. So yeah. it's a fair question, isn't it? It is. Well, I've got another question. I mean, this is, you're going to have to give a more specific que- uh, question, like how to get 27 seconds, 50 butterfly. Are you currently 28? Are you currently 29? Are you currently 32? I mean, it's a, mm. You know, you got to give us more than that. Sam Sam Murphy out in uh, Melbourne tunes in for swimming content every week at midnight Melbourne time. Gets yep. Netflix recommendation to murder series. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, Sam, get on this murder. His name is uh, Mur. The, the last name is Murder. It's, it's happening in like South Carolina. It's just a, it's fascinating, but it's America, you know. You know, America has the greatest number of serial killers in the in the world, like by by like a massive margin. But uh, what I found out in regards to that statistic is, uh, America is really the only country that talks about their their serial killers in mm-hmm. in a great detail and studies them. And so I think there's probably serial killers everywhere, right? But I don't know. 
America <laughs> celebrates them. So <laughs> that's, that, that's probably why there's more than any other country because they get a Netflix documentary. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Here's you, Brett, is sprint freestyle better with hip rotation or chest rotation? Uh, sprint freestyle. So uh, if we're talking about a 50 freestyle, we're, we're definitely going to talk more of the, the chest shoulder rotation. Like you want, you want your rotation to come from here. You know, you guys know that I, I talk all the time about keeping those armpits dry. So as you come up, oh, wrong one, right, as, you, you as you come up and over, okay, you want to come up and get those armpits dry. So yeah, you've got to have a lot of rotation in, in the shoulders and chest area. And then you want to keep your hips fairly square. So it's not like you want to go over onto your hips and then over onto your hip all the way. So um, hit, the hip will stay fairly square and the shoulders will do most of the rotation in a 50 freestyle. So I would say the answer to that would be more chest rotation than hip rotation. And go on any questions and you can ask Brett, James, Gibson, a million other experts questions like that. Surprise, yeah. Brett's normally quick to the plug of any question, so I'll plug it for him. Every um, week, man. Let's go. Any question every week. We're getting bigger. Big we're getting statement. better. Dressel out of shape versus MA in shape, 100 IM. I'm I'm probably going to agree with that. Um, did I ever see Tom Shields and Leclo race underwater? Who won? I'll be honest. We, we had the two of them in the pool you know, all the way up to World Short Course together. And at that point in time, it was Tom Shields getting the better of Chad Leclerc underwater, purely underwater. Tom yeah. Shields from the push is unbelievable. The guy yeah. hasn't got a great dive. He'll admit this himself. But from the push, Tom Shields is one of the best swimmers ever. He's yeah. Well, yeah. he's one of the best swimmers ever there anyway. But yeah. from the push, Jesus Christ. Push into underwater fly kicking. Tom Shields can do pretty much anyone on earth. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Tommy had Tommy had a wicked, wicked good short course, but he also had years of developing it. You know, um, swimming short course yards and having those types of performances that he did. So, you know, it's not fair to compare the two completely because Tom had way more experience doing it. But but Tom is definitely a wickedly good underwater dolphin kicker. Absolutely. Do you think sports betting should come to swimming? Would it bring more funding to the sport? It's quite a loaded question. Sports betting, yeah. Um, look, I guess it's I guess it should be really inevitable, shouldn't it? Because sports betting is in every every sport almost, you know. So it's like, um, but sports betting, I believe in Australia you can you can bet on swimming. I'm not sure why you can't in America. Um, I'm not, I don't know the answer to that question. Why can you do it in Australia? Cause my dad's bet on me in the past and you can't do it in America. Interesting. Huh? Can you bet on sports in the UK? Yeah, we can, we can bet on swimming in the UK. I mean, the odds aren't great and there's not, you know, the best things to bet on, but you can do the accumulator. So you could say like, oh, at the Olympics, Adam Pete, will win the hundred breast. Caleb Dress will win the 50 freestyle you know whatever yeah. you can do them accumulators which ends up getting you mm. i'm not a betting guy anyway but i think for the sport in terms of it getting more present you know the thing is we bet on a, a, in the uk the horse race is massive right you, you know you know you bet on a horse to run in a line and people bet on the horse races swimming is like a more exciting version of horse racing surely to in terms of like loads of races back to back that you can bet on every one of them you know in football, you bet on one match and you have to watch 90 minutes to get a result. In swimming, in a two-hour session, you can bet on 20 races. You could win one, lose one, win one. You know, surely that's uh, an exciting thing to bet on. I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't bet. but Yeah, I don't bet either. I don't have the money to waste on betting. I just uh, I just throw out my bets and, and watch them lose and then be like, okay, well, I lost. <laughs> <laughs> we just talk about it. It's better that way. I think so too. What's the public pressure for US Euro swimmers mental health wise? And what's the support? I mean, I'll just start off and say the support is really poor. I know someone on the British swimming team. And at the beginning of this season, they get like a load of stuff from British swimming. You're, you're on funding, you're on our, you know, our, our, our main team. And they get a, they have to tick a box by watching a like 10 minute video that talks to you about mental health. And that's like, that's the, the support you get. And mm. everyone has to confirm they watched mental health in swimming video that was 10 minutes long. That was British swimming's 
attempt at, you know, ticking that box. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I've actually got a podcast coming out with um, somebody uh, on this subject, which I think will be fantastic. Um, so Samantha Livingston. Samantha is a mental health uh, expert, advocate, uh, worker, and has her own business now. She swam for the U.S. on the 2000 Olympic team 800 free relay. They won a, a gold medal. And she said she stood on the top of the podium and she felt very unsatisfied, uh, even though she'd finally accomplished her dream. And so then it took her years to come to terms with it all. And then she ended up starting her own business and company where she she works uh, with with athletes on on mental health awareness and, and how to co- combat it. So what I this specific question I asked her in the podcast, which is coming out, I don't know, maybe maybe tomorrow might be might be tomorrow's episode. I don't know if to get with Nate on that one, but. I asked her a specific question. How do you define mental toughness in 2023? Because that's that's an interesting thing, right? What is mental toughness now as what, what it, it used to be, right? Mental toughness used to be just shut up, grit your teeth, and keep going. Now it's something completely different. So that's what we kind of dig into here. And she answers that question fairly extensively. You know, where are we? What's the pressure? What's the support? Things like that. So that, that podcast will be coming out either – tomorrow or the following week so check out that one good one sounds like a real good one there uh anyway we've done a few questions now it's uh probably time to cast our eye on to uh what's actually happened mm. this uh this weekend just gone and swimming apparently uh nate's chimed in you've got tanaka jameson tomorrow on the podcast going live oh so, yes, uh, yes yes the one you just talked about maybe it'll be next next tuesday um we can yeah. hope but sounds yeah. like a good one yeah, Tanika. Tanika's the head coach of the Houston swimming and diving team. They just won their conference title. Mm-hmm. Um, she used to be the assistant coach at Texas A&M for Steve Boltman. So if you know the A&M program and Steve Boltman, Tanika was the assistant. Well, I think eventually she ended up being like an associate head coach there for the women's team. Um, they ended up being a top three team in the nation. Then she went on just recently to take over at Houston. So we we talked to her and, and dig into her um, career a little bit. So it was a good one. All right. Well, if you don't already follow Nate's little swim span thing, here it is. It's brilliant. And um, there's a load of load of fast swims from around the world in this little section here. So uh, mm. first of all, we had uh, – I can't say it. You said it, Brett. L- 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 Switzerland. We had Switzerland swim span. Hussein? Hussein, yeah. Mm. Um, we had a couple of South Africans in Matthew Sates and, and Tatiana Showmaker, Schoolmaker, um, in the two, in the, the breaststroke. We had a Swedish in Louise Hansen. Florent Manadou was there racing Mayron Sharuti in the 53. We had a big British uh, cohort with PT, Wilby, Hopkin, um, and some others. So we had, we had quite a few swimmers there. Um, any of these results stand out to you? I thought Louise was great. Um, you know, she, she always is pretty good. I actually saw a 50, she went 57 in the final, I think, for the 100 fly. So she was a bit quicker than what, what Nate's put here. But PT, how, how did he look to you, Brett? Uh, I don't know. I didn't see the race at all. But uh, Petey's Petey, you know. He he's, he always gets the job done, loves to race. I think it's early season for all these all mm-hmm. these guys, um, you know, be racing long course again. So I think it's just a matter of getting used to the length, um, you know, seeing where you are in your training having little uh, butterflies for the competition again, getting getting race ready. So I think that's what uh, the this does, you know. But, uh, you know, coming off the back of us talking about Flo Manadu last week, Flo got beaten this one on his first first uh, swim back, you know. I think you had you had predicted that he would never go 21 flat again, and, uh, and uh, we had a little bit of fun with that. And I said he would, but here, here he was back in his first swim. I think he went 22-3. So he's still got a long way to go for for him to prove me right and you wrong. So, uh, look, we love Flo Menadu, but um, getting beaten your first swim of the season is not always ideal. But I'm, I'm sure he's, he's in heavy training. So uh, it is where it is. Yeah, I mean, these results ultimately don't mean much. You can delve into Adam Peaty going PB plus three seconds exactly in the 100 breast. That's how far he was off. Three mm. whole seconds. But what does it mean? 
You know, well, it doesn't mean anything. You know, like I wouldn't bet against Adam Pete even if he went a minute point of this meet. You know, like uh, he's literally just flown back from Australia, travelled across the world. You know, and the same with Flo. Flo was in the USA last week. All these things they they add up, and ultimately these meets don't mean that much. But you know, we have a good point here. I wish all swimmers. I don't think they all need to be because some are making money. You know doing their own things. But Matt Sates comes up to these meets, gets a load of prize money. Him and Louise Hansen apparently made around seven, 8,000 euros, I guess, over the weekend. Mm. You, can't, you can't knock it by doing that sort of mentality of just going and make money at these meets, right? Well, it helps when you're uh, multi-versatile like that, right? Where you yep. can swim multiple events and, and back up, you know. So it's it's uh, it's not for everybody, but certainly Matt is is – Again, I, I go back to the Katinka Hoshu mentality of like, you know, Katinka really set the standard for people like Matt Sates to go around and do these things, uh, Louise Hansen. So, you know, if you're if you're a multi-event swimmer and you've got the ability to fly around the world and compete, Katinka set the standard on this and uh, made millions, literally millions doing it this way. Mm-hmm. And and did it for many years, so it's nice to see other people catching on and doing it now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as we go a little further, this is another meet we had. We had a meet in Mexico, the Jalisco International Swimming Cup, and the bit mm. I was most excited about here was uh, this guy racing, the 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 Nicholas Santos. We talked about him last week about you know he's forty three now, he's retired, but. He obviously got an invite to this meet. There was obviously some money, you know, in it for him. And he's rocked up and he's beaten a, a pretty class field with Michael Andrew and Dylan Carter going 23-4, 50 butterfly. I think he's ranked second or third in the world this year with that swim. So is he is he retired? Is he officially retired or is he officially uh, continuing to swim? Well, what was the statement he made? Did he say, I'm not swimming a world shore course ever again? Or did he say, I'm not swimming ever again? I think, you know, was it just to... Maybe he's not going to go to the next World Short Course, but maybe, you know, if you swim in February, a 23-4 long course 50 butterfly, why not go to World Champs? You know, like, it seems a little stupid not to, right? Yeah, well, I don't know his family situation. I know he's got kids and stuff and he's married. So, you know, there's definitely obligations and maybe he's got businesses now that he's got to tend to. So, yeah, he is 43. So it's not like he, he can just sit around and, you know, compete forever if if that's not the mentality anymore or where his lifestyle is. But at the same time, like you said, 23-4 is legit. He goes down there, he beats a class field. He's only he's only six, you know, less than six months out from the world championship. So I don't see why not. He's not going to swim at the Olympics. We know that. So there's no 50 fly at the Olympics. Yep. And he's not going to make the relay team, let's say. So yeah, have have one more crack at this world world title and then then retire. Yeah, yeah, I, I, he no, is retired. What... He's saying here he's retired, but was, he was paid a good appearance fee for the meet. <clears throat> yeah, but retired means you're out of the testing pool. So if you're out of the testing pool, you can't compete at certain meets. So depending on what type of meet this was, he can't Maybe just it wasn't. rock up. Yeah, <clears throat> it, it depends if it was FINA FINA licensed or not. Um, yeah. Just a quick quick question here. It's quite a good question. Is height important in swimming? And how do short swimmers like Tomoru Hondu uh, swim so fast? Dice say it was another great, you know, example of this. But Honda, 200 fly, world record holder, short course, um, medaled at the Olympics, medaled at world champs. And he's, yeah, like five foot six or something. Well, you've got to take <clears throat> factors into consideration, right? What are the fa- What are the factors of fast swimming? Fast swimming, you need to be, uh, you need to be, you, you need to be able to hold water, right? So first of all, you need to be aquatic. So is this five five foot whatever person aquatic? Because you could have a five, you could yeah, have a five six little nugget, and he's not flexible. He's not aquatic. You know, but you have a five six little fluid dolphin, and you know it's it's a completely <laughs> different thing. So. I think that's the thing. How do you sit in the water? How do you hold water? That's that. They're the real factors, right? Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> Don't be a nugget. Be a dolphin. There yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter if you're seven foot, you know, like 
uh, some of the biggest basketball players in the world are just they're just jacked, you know. And it's like they but but you could have a seven foot giant who's who's very aquatic and very fluid. So it really doesn't come down to the size of the person. It comes down to how how do they sit in the water and what can they do with the water? Mm. How aquatic are they? That's really that's that's a David Marsh word, aquatic. You know, he he used to use that a lot. Be aquatic. So that's the way I would look at it. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I think uh, when you look at good at the skills of them them guys as well, Dyer, Honda, and there's there's still perks like them guys underwater are unbelievable, um, which kind of goes mm-hmm. back to that aquatic point. Yeah. Um, another quick question from an aquatic creature in the Dolphin King, but can Brett compare contrast Vlad Morozov straight arm and Fred Busquet straight arm? They're very different strokes in my opinion, so um, I'm interested in your thoughts. I mean, I hadn't really studied Vlad too hard. You know, obviously spent many years working with Fred. And and Fred, again, like I go back to Fred's strengths, right? Fred, Fred was lanky. He had, he, had, he had good length in his arms, like really long arms, right? Um, Fred was worked on his flexibility all the time. So like Fred could put himself in positions, but... But Fred was also a little awkward, you know. We used to call him we used to call him monkey arms, you know, because he would swim kind of like a monkey, you know. He'd come over the top and and get this like grab, and and he would he would, he would just latch onto the water really early, and he would kind of drive his hand down to the bottom of the pool. Um, he'd get very good shoulder rotation. Again, uh, this is where the concept of keep keeping those armpits dry came from. Fred really. You know, he was great. He was a, it was a phenomenal flutter kicker. You put Fred on a board and he could kick as fast as anybody on a board I've ever seen. So, you know, Fred had incredible qualities. I'd never worked with Vlad and I've never really studied Vlad too hard. For, Vlad was a little bit shorter, a little bit, probably a little bit more power athlete. Didn't seem like he had the same rotation, a little bit flatter to me. Um, so, look, they, they both worked in, in their own rights. Uh, and so it, it's hard to say one was better than the other necessarily. They're just slightly different, right? Yeah. Uh, they, everyone's different to a degree, right? Um, just going back to the results, um, this is a really interesting choice of picture, Nate. Um, seems like we're we're honed in here on uh, Mike Andrews' crotch. Yeah, it didn't seem to line up very well. I think it was going for his face, and uh, the picture didn't line up very well there. So <laughs> I might have to switch that one out. <laughs> what else we got here? Daniel but, Whiffen. You know, you know, you know Daniel Whiffen, don't you? Yeah, he's a great lad. Uh, one of two Irish twins. Um, he was competing in Luff- um, for Loughborough in in Sheffield for the British University Championships, and it's look. We had a lot of big names. Duncan Scott and a couple other guys like that were there as prelim only swimmers, as, as we mentioned. So they can. What I was saying last week is. Basically, you can be a guest. I don't know how you get to be a guest. I don't think I can be a guest, but Duncan Scott can be a guest. But he doesn't get the swim finals. But he he had a crack at the 4 a.m. and the 2 free in, in the same session as well. So they were back-to-back swims. A little, little quick, a lot slower than Matt Sates was in finals for them swims, but still pretty solid. Good showing, especially in the 1500 by, by Whiff, uh, 1502, um, knocking on that 15-minute barrier. Um, Andreas Vasayos was there swimming everything. Laura Stevens was there, but the best swimmer of the meet, in my opinion, was probably Katie Shanahan going a 208 0 200 back and a 211 2 IM, both PBs and meet records. Um, so yeah, really exciting stuff. Scottish Katie DeLuf was there. Wow, where's where's Katie DeLuf swimming these days? She's at Loughborough as well. Oh, she's at Loughborough. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, good for um, her. 54 1. That's that's some good swimming in season for her. Yeah, I think it's her third fastest time ever. Her PB is 53.8 from 2020 trials or 2021 trials, I guess. Um, so, yeah, she, she's, I don't know, maybe she can have a crack on the door and get on that 4 by one team uh, this summer. Yeah, yeah that, I think it's the, the aim there, isn't it? You know, you take a risk like that going over to another country and and uh, getting out of your comfort zone. I think the, that the idea behind it is, you know, you want to be successful at the end of it. So she looks like she's made some good choices. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, they go at a Scottish record as well from Cara Hanlon. 106, first Scottish woman under 107 in 100 breast. Uh, she, she's swimming really well. She's improving a really quick rate. I watched her swim short course at the end of last year, and that was good. And then here we go, into the yards at last. Um, all the American people watching have been waiting readily to talk about yards. But we had 
We have a few conferences. We had my new favourite conference, the Big 12, where three teams go head-to-head and it seems like a bit of a pointless affair. <laughs> um, but we did have a proper conference in Pac-12s where you've got Stanford, one of the best women's teams of the last 10 years, going up against Cal. Obviously, uh, I've been in the media quite a bit because of the Terry situation, but you know they've got some great swimmers in their own right. Um, and then, yeah, Claire Curzon going this 147.3 was probably the biggest standout. Yeah, yeah, it's good to see Stanford winning again, and uh, and it's also good to see Cal bouncing back from all the mess they went through, kind of in the last twelve months, and they're posting really good swims. So I think both those teams will be uh, obviously super competitive at the NCA, which is great again. And then um, yeah, uh, you did have a bunch of different conferences. the The Indiana men won again. The Indiana men looked really strong. The Rays got yep. them in a great place. So. Yeah. Um, did Half now he compete? No. No, he's not allowed. I did see uh, Bobby Guntoro's team um, out in Nate's town. They they won the conference for women and men's for the first time. So oh. that was really good. Um, wow. Good I don't know how, how, how any more about that in, or even what the conference is, but I know Bobby Guntoro done a good job. Uh, college and um, high school swimming now. God, this is... Uh, Getting real out there now. Yeah, Nate, how come that's not in the roundup, by the way? Why doesn't Bobby Guntura get a shout out in the roundup, yeah. Nate? We've got to fix this. Okay, I'm skipping Bobby, through. Bobby's going to be very upset. First time in history they've won men and women. What's all this stuff? This 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 kid, I don't know. what What is this? Scotty Buff, he was rapid though. 100 fly, 44. State record and national record. Oh, this, kid, this kid's like a high school kid. Yeah. Oh, 44 is legit, yeah. Yeah. That's real quick. Scotty How Buff. That, look at the times he goes as well that don't even get a gold. 46 doesn't even get a gold at like high school, high school states. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, 50 back. Yeah, didn't even get a – oh, wow. We, we, we can... How's this guy look? I'm guessing he's the guy winning. I can't see it. Does it not come up? Oh, <clears throat> There we go. There it is. I, I could see it, but I was sharing the wrong screen. Hmm. It looks pretty good. I mean, the, the the common theme in all these yard swims is using that 15 meters. Look at that. He's Everybody. breaking out on the Everybody's like, last using 25. It. Last it's 25, funny. he's going 15 underwater. How far was that race? Was that a – oh, yeah. Oh, is it really? What is this? This is just. I think he just replays on loop because it's Twitter. Oh, right, right. Scotty Buff just crushing the field. Yeah. Good for him. Uh, they're not as exciting times. Hang on, hang on. Uh, wasn't there one from Carmel? Find the kid from Carmel. Is is he not? Who's the kid from Carmel? He went 132, I yeah, believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ohio, is that it? No, that's not one it. One of these. I, I didn't see that as well, 132. Yeah. This, this, this is not up to scratch this? this week. Who's this guy? Who's this? Some kid broke Ryan Murphy's record? What, 45 0, 100 back in high school again. That's that's quick. That's real quick. Jesus, the start. Oh, he looks good. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> you have 45 flat in high school you're gonna look real good against some competition oh he's he's <laughs> he's not actually against other people near his level is he like he's uh wow isn't it sick isn't it sick how one human can be so much better than everybody else look at this kid apparently, apparently this was prelims as well he's just dropped it in the heats yeah i think they do that i think they go fast in the heats for some reason i don't know why He's not quite hitting the 15 kickouts as well. He looks re- like his stroke rate looks really smooth and nice. Oh, he didn't die at all, did he? He just crushed that. <laughs> I like how the video stops and everyone else has still got 10 meters to swim. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was me in high school. I was at the back. There we go. Aaron Chaplin. Go. That's my boy. Is, is he, the, is he the, the butterfly girl's little brother? No, big brother. Big he's, brother. Uh, yeah, he's committed to – so she's she's – 15 or 16, he's 17 or 18. You know, he's the older brother. So he's committed to Cal. He's going to Cal. Yeah. And um, and again, r- just as a reminder, 
Nick Shackle was my roommate in college and Allie, who is his wife, was his girlfriend in college. And, uh, and we were on the same team together. So we're friends. So this is my friend's son and daughter who are just absolutely tearing the U.S. swimming record board apart right now. Yeah, good for what them. A, what, what a pair of siblings, hey? You know, you, you talk about breaking Carson Foster's record. He's another great sibling sort of swimmer situation with him and his brother Jake. And uh, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people, uh, I know who recruited this kid. I know, and I know some of the offers that were given to him. A lot of people were not offering him much of a scholarship about 12 months ago. Uh, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of people were selling him short and I was, I, I couldn't believe it myself. First of all, I was like, look at the, look at the pedigree of mum and dad. Yeah. Look at where he trains at Carmel and the coaches he's got. And then look at how underdeveloped he was 12 months ago. Like he, he was a, he was, when I met him, he was a 16 year old kid and he, and he had the body of a 16 year old, yeah. but he looked mm -hmm. like he, he, he looked physically look like he was 14, you know, like he was mm -hmm. just, very underdeveloped. You could tell that this kid had so much growth in him. And all of a sudden, 12 months later, here he is going 132. And um, and he's starting to fill out and he's starting to develop. And I think a lot of people missed a massive opportunity here with him, apart from Cal, who ended up getting him, which is awesome. But I know that, that even that offer was late in the game, but a lot of people uh, were, were underselling him. So, well. Fortunately for him, he's at one of the best schools in the country, and that's hopefully going to be really good for him, you know. So yeah, I'm sure he's going to develop real well there. Um, cool, we've got some more more questions coming in. Uh Blue Sapphire, back to the height thing said. So you want to say that like a five foot ten person can swim sub 48? Yeah, they can. Vlad Morozov's like five ten, five eleven, and went forty seven six. So yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. Uh now what? What were the main lessons you learned from David Marsh and Richard Quick? Oh, listen, we could write a book on those main lessons. Like, come on, that's that's not a that's not a thirty second answer, and uh, too much detail to go into there. Way too much. And look, you've got to go back to my old podcast with David Marsh. You got to go into any question. Here we go. There's my plug. Um, Richard Quick. Uh, listen, R Richard Quick was. Just, you know, the, the number one thing from Richard Quick, I'll give you this. The number one thing from Richard Quick, when he, when I met him, he was in his 60s. He'd been multi-Olympic coach, you know, multiple times head coach. He'd been, uh, he'd won the national title with Stanford, you know, 11 times or something like that with the women's team, something, something crazy with the women's team. And he'd been the head coach. Like, but anyway, long story short, Richard Quick was in his 60s. He'd done everything he needed to do. And he was still trying to get better he was still asking questions he was still experimenting he was still trusting me as a young coach to say hey brett what do you think he would ask me that all the time brett what do you think about this i'm like richard you're the most experienced coach i've ever met like what do you think you know so he was he was always like that he was very inquisitive always asking questions always trying to get better always trying to learn from the people around him and he respected the janitor and the ad right? The janitor who came in every day and cleaned the place and the AD who ran the place, he respected them exactly the same way at the, on the same level, right? He would, he would walk into the pool every day and thank the person that opened the door and cleaned the floors for us. And he would do the same thing for the athletic director. So he didn't treat people differently based on who they were and what they could do for him in that sense, you know? Mm. good man it was a good surname as well uh quick what a perfect surname mm -hmm. very quick so what else we got we got hidand Hid hidandage sorry whatever hidi um i have a problem in my club everyone is faster than me i have early vertical forearm and good kick high body position but somehow children who are shorter than me and younger and don't have early vertical forearm are faster than me Get stronger. You're not strong enough. You got to get stronger. You're obviously not holding the water the way they're holding it. You might you might get in early, but you might slip because you don't have the strength to hold it. So, I would say get stronger. Um, and you can start by getting stronger by using your body weight, pull ups, push ups. You know all these sorts of things. You don't have to go in the gym necessarily and get stronger. 
you could wake up in the morning and give yourself a hundred push-ups before you hit the showers, you know, or or put your swimsuit on to go to practice. Whatever it is, just get yourself stronger. That would be no, my number one thing there. Also, I, I don't know how old you are, but when when you're going through development, people that people might be faster than you, but it all equals out when you get to you know eighteen plus. So just give it some time and just keep doing the right things. But also, you talk about having an early vertical forearm, but if you're trying to swim. 50 freestyle and you're worrying about this perfect high elbow catch, then you might not have the stroke rate and, and the uh, the turnover to actually go a fast time. So there's other mm. stuff as well. It's not always about looking super pretty. It's uh, about being effective at swimming. And you, you mm. say these other kids don't have that, but they, they might have a much more applicable stroke rate to the events you're swimming. Yeah. Um, William Morin has asked, do you guys tune into the Canadian university champs? Gabe, went 101 long course 100 breast and i did know it was the U sports champs I, you know it's a really weird me because they have short course mornings long course evenings but honestly i, I watched some of bucks i watched some of uh the, the the switzerland meet that's all i had time for this weekend you know i can't watch every single meet um under the sun but uh I'm, you know if there's any other results let us know we'd definitely be interested who's jamie kale I don't know. I don't know either. I don't know who Jamie is. Let's get. Let's have a look here. Oh. You can give us more information on Jamie. I don't oh, know. Sudden death of former U.S. swimming sensation Jamie Cow, Pan Panpack gold medalist. Okay. She was. What? She was. She was found dead dead on the floor by her boyfriend, aged forty-two. Oh wow! Living in the Virgin Islands. All right. Well, I didn't know that. I apologize. Well, that's uh, real, real terrible stuff. And uh, yeah. Well, on to a more, more happy note. Is Eric Burns related to Brendan Burns? Who, who's Eric Burns? Well, I don't know. He could be. Is he? Is he related? Oh, right. to, oh, to, oh, to oh Eric. Um, Oh, Eric, Eric's the one saying it. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Eric Eric said he had a good laugh seeing uh, Nate's email about how Brendan yawned after his two back at Big Tens. He, we didn't talk about Brendan, but he's done it, I think, like three years in a row. He wins the 200 fly and the 200 back in the same session at conference. I think he was 138 two back, 139 two fly. Oh, I got Eric is, Eric is the dad of, of Brendan. So, yeah, shout outs to Brendan because what a phenomenal swimmer, right? Um, Putting them swims back to back, you know. Ha, ha, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll watch the little. Uh, we'll watch the little clip. I've got it here. Oh, here it is. Let's get the yawn going. Where is it? Yawn. I guess he had a little. Oh <laughs> man! Just put that to bed. Nice. I like that. That's 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 class stuff, eh? Easy money. That's what he's saying. Easy money. Uh, it's... So is it easy to do a two fly two back in the same session at Hell no. conference level? Hell no. That's why he gave it a little <laughs> yawn. He knows it's not easy, but he just letting everyone know that it was easy for him, you know, putting it on him. I love that. Well, good job to your son, Eric. He, uh, he, he done fantastic on the weekend and also made us laugh on the, on a Monday morning. So yeah, great he's stuff. A stud. He's a stud. Keep it going, mate. Let's see it at NCAAs. Do the same thing there and have another yawn. That'd be good. That would be good. Um, we're, we're rooting for it. Igor has asked, what is the difference between David Popovich and other freestyle swimmers? What is he doing the others is not? Is his technique superior than others' techniques? I don't know. A lot to get into there. But I'll tell you this. Let's let's change the, the, the subject a little bit on Popovich. Popovich came out on the weekend and posted something on Facebook. Did you see it? Where he basically said, I'm going to start to put my family first. He, he basically prioritized his life in the future and basically said, hey, I'm changing up my priorities. Family's going to be number one. My community is going to be number two. And then my swimming is going to be number three. So he basically made this public statement on, on Facebook. See if you can find it. I'll see if and I'll maybe find even it. pull it up. But definitely, uh, it, was, it was this weekend I read it, and I was actually kind of a little bit surprised that he was making this announcement the way he did. Um, but, yeah. Uh, came out and, and said he's he's going to put his family first. Well, I'm not exactly goes. sure what it means either. Um, I'd like to get more clarification from him on it. 
Greetings to all. I believe that the last few weeks I've been unclear about my future plans and I think I owe you an answer. Mm. I will split my energy between my soulmates, family, friends, studies and sports. Mm. All three are very important to me so I can grow as a human and feel like I'm doing what I love, what I'm passionate about and also the right thing. Family comes first. Professional yeah. growth is important and I owe the sport with sincerity sincerity and understanding at the same time i'll be involved in social causes in the near future mm -hmm. i wish very much for us to be successful as a country and as people i want to see as many romanians happy and healthy as possible i feel the need to get more involved we have to help romania with success stories but also with the hope that everyone can see can succeed over and overcome anything supporting each other is important keeping it close yeah, I mean, I love it. I just don't know what it means exactly. So I thought he was doing that anyway. I thought that was really his whole purpose in life was family first and then, you know, uh, country and citizens and, and then a balance between his uh, athletic ventures. So I don't know what is the difference in that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, I'm confused as well because, you know, I, I think it family's important but i don't think that should take anything away from still being you know a full-time swimmer and the opportunity he's going to get from continuing to swim at this level is going to be great for both romania you know the 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 overall perception of romania is going to be enhanced by him what what he can offer his family in terms of money from financial you know offers he will get from being such a great swimmer i don't know why you would want to take anything away from your swimming to do any of them things um they kind of go hand in hand and as you, you you know, people on your podcast have shown how they can gain on such a you know a level or platform they gain from their ability to swim. People like Kirsty Coventry and stuff, you know, they gain this platform by first succeeding in sport. Um, and I just think it's weird that he would turn his attention away from swimming at all when he's you know a year away from the Olympics. And you know, let's just say it as it is, he's not an Olympic champion yet. Mm, yeah. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not sure what it means. I, it, to me, it just seemed like a reconfirmation of the things that I believed about him. Anyway, it wasn't it wasn't like he was really telling me something that I didn't think was obviously true about him in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, but um, you know, in in relation to the money thing, I know he doesn't care about money. Uh, I'll give him that, and I, and he, and his his family's probably a little bit more conscious of it in the fact that he's got the ability to earn money now, which is which is great, you know. But they're they're looking at it in, in the sense of like, well, how how will this affect him and what can it do for him as a person rather than just accumulating wealth in that sense? So they're, they're, they're yeah. coming at it from a very, uh, you know, unique perspective of like, we're not just going to grab money. So I get that. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I put out something the other day with Steve Irwin. Steve Irwin, basically, it was his uh, birthday or, you know, it was his, it was his birthday, but Steve Irwin's not with us anymore. Obviously, a man died many years ago. But he had a quote where he basically said, I love money. I want to make as much money as I can so that everybody give me money so I can put it back into conservation. I think that's kind of what you're saying with David here is like, look, it's not about how much money can David make, but David has the ability to make a lot of money and impact a lot of people. Yep. So if you really want to impact your community and Romania and other things like that, then get as much money as you can, kind of like Steve Irwin, and then just give it back. You know, you don't have to keep it all. But like you, if people are wanting to give you money and, and you represent them and it, and it allows you to still fulfill who you are, then take it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And I think that's kind of where David is right now trying to figure out, well, how can I be both? How can I be true to myself and, and yet make as much money as I can, but not do it for the money? You know, but yeah. the money is powerful and useful and can be put to so much good use in a country like Romania where... You might not have, you know, they, they talk about the fact that they don't have the facilities that other countries have. Well, make as much money as you can and build a facility yep. and, and call it David Popovich, you know, Olympic pool and then have a lasting impact for many generations to come, you know. So yeah. anyway, that's my philosophy. But the, also the me. legacy, he, you know, he'll leave, you know, just by him being an Olympic champion next year, if he does, you know, the amount of kids that will want to swim because of that mm -hmm. moment, that moment in Romania will be massive, right? This, this, you know, he'll be 19 at the time swimming at the Olympics. And if he, if he wins that gold medal, the amount of kids that would then sign up to swim lessons, learn to swim, the amount of kids that would join a swimming club, 
you know, that that's also the, the legacy and the impact you have by doing something great in a country like Romania. So I yeah. agree on your points. And Yeah, think- the Olympic gold is a lasting legacy that will last forever. That will never be taken away from you. Once you're an Olympic gold medalist in the 100 freestyle, the, the Blue Ribbon event, you know, uh, that that never goes away, man, you know. Yep. But he, I mean, he's definitely still training. There's there's a post look on the Facebook of him in Tenerife at the top training facility, February the tenth. Yeah, yeah. So you know, he's he's. I don't think swimming's any less of a focus. Um, or at least I hope not. And uh, I think he's going to be swimming fast this year for all of us to enjoy. Yeah, yeah, I agree. All um, right, that's it. Well, I got to wrap up. That's forty five minutes. Wow, that yep. went pretty quick. Um, but we got into a lot of questions. We got into some swimming is there anything coming up this week now this week i guess the the cal men the pac-12 men are this week Mm -hmm. so in america that's going to be a big deal where you got stanford cal those teams uh even asu asu a lot of talk about the asu men's team they're going to be hot this week at at the pac-12 so yeah someone's calling in to talk about it (laughs) Yeah, um, yeah. No, yeah, I'm really excited for that Pac-12 for me. I think that's the most exciting conference on paper. But um, have we not also got the? Uh, oh my god! Someone's no bugging way. you, mate. Someone will not stop. Yeah. Uh, have we not got the Tier Pro Series in Fort Lauderdale this weekend? Is it really? Okay. Don't I'm know. pretty sure. I, I was just googling it, but you know, there's like the fields there are absolutely yeah, first to fourth of March. That's this weekend. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, we've got Katie Ledecky racing, Siobhan Jorge racing. Everyone's there. Like, it's 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 real deep. The this Portuguese weekend. guys are over there. It, wow, it's going to be what? a great meet. It's going to be a great meet. I might have to fly down to that. If it's in Fort Lauderdale, i got I got buddies down. I mean, uh, Bruno lives down there. I might go, go see Bruno. And, uh, you know, Bruno, Bruno bought himself a new uh, motorcycle. He's got himself a Harley Davidson now. Bruno's riding around Fort Lauderdale on a Harley Davidson. Wow. There How's we that? go. Go hop on his Harley and go yeah. watch the Pro Series in three days where Summer McIntosh is about to do some damage. I, I did see she's doing her first two fly since the last, like, Commie Games. So, uh, mm. yeah, it's going to be, cool. be an exceptional meet. I'm, I'm quite excited for that one. Yeah, how good would it be if Bruno and I just rock up to the meet? I'm on the back of his Harley and he's just... Brum, 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 brum. That'll be good. Uh, that would be it. very good. <laughs> I think it needs to happen. Get some footage of that. Okay, that'll happen yes. this weekend. All right, guys. Peace. Catch you in a bit, guys.